God. And Father, just I pray that you would unify your church through MBM Youth here tonight for your glory and for your name. Amen. Hey, just before I start, hey, can we give a round of applause to Aiden Beef at the back, jumps in to do camera, first time ever, never done it before, filling in. How good is that? Thanks, buddy. I'll try not to move around too much tonight, okay? (laughs) Hey, the other day, um, the other night I asked my little brothers, I said, after we read the Bible together, uh, I said, do you guys know what the word church means? And they kind of looked at each other, and they thought for a bit, looked at me, and one of them said, God? And I thought, not quite, but you know, you're on the right track. Another one said, praising Jesus? And I said, you know, that's what we do when we gather as a church, but not quite. Other one said, oh, as, is it where we go on Sundays? I thought, now you're getting to the point. And then the other one, Aiden, he closed off the conversation and, and said this, I bet you, bet you there's a real meaning to this word church. And he was spot on, because there is. The church, the word church, and some of you might know this already, it means gathering. It means congregation. That's literally what that word means. It actually pops up in the New Testament around 115 times. Church, it's the gathering. But what of? It's the gathering of the people. What kind of people? Is it just any people that we can grab from the street? And as we gather... Uh, We just call that church. It's actually the gathering of Christians, God's people, followers of Jesus. If you want to think about last week and put that into a perspective, it's, it's followers, it's disciples of Jesus gathering in his name. That's what church is. But we're not looking at the question, what is church tonight? I thought it'd be helpful to get that bit of context before we start answering the question. The question tonight is, what if we really believed that the church, the people, are God's family? It's really asking, what should it look like as disciples of Jesus gather together? Or where do we want to be in five years' time? How should our gatherings look? What do we want them to look like? Let's dream big. And let's ask God and to do a great work in us so that we can maximize this calling for his people as we're unified as a family. So really there's two kind of uh, answers tonight from the question. So th- these are the two answers, you ready? The first one is, if we really believed that the church is God's family, number one, we would put our church family first. And number two, we would love them like Jesus. So let's focus on the first one. If we really believe that the church is God's family, we would put our church family first. Now, I talked about my brothers before. I've got two brothers, two sisters, and two parents. That makes up my family. I love my family. I'm really privileged to be a part of that family. There's a photo, I think, coming up of uh, what they look like. That's them without me and my little niece. That's my fam bam. How good are they? Yeah, they're great. That's my family. Um, I make sure that I block out time in my week to spend time with them. In a way, they're kind of like my priority. I'm born into that family, so I need to make time for them above other people. Uh, my, there's a screenshot, I think, of my calendar that I've, in the blue, they're the times I've blocked out to spend time with my family. So I prioritize them in my week. Uh, in a way, that's what we're called to do, aren't we? If we're, if we're born into a family. But you know what? I want to go a little bit deeper. I want to say that even more so, even more so, we are called to put our church family above any other human being. We're called to put disciples, fellow disciples, above others. Do you think that's a big call? What do you reckon? Jesus doesn't seem to think so. In Mark chapter 3, is a gospel in the New Testament. Jesus is in a house. Not yet. Jesus is in a house. And Jesus is debating the teachers of the law in this house. And there's a big crowd that forms around. You can imagine that they'd want to see what's going on. And his family actually come to the house. I think they're a bit embarrassed at what Jesus is doing. And they think they're trying to take him out of the situation. And others in the crowd said, Jesus, your family are here. His mom and his brothers. And Jesus responds to them like this. In verse 33. Who are my brothers and mother? He asked. I think that's a strange thing to say. When his family, his blood family, who's his, who he's born into, come to the scene, Jesus says, who are my mother and brothers? 
Has he forgotten who his family is? Is he having an argument with his family? What's going on? Let's keep reading. Verse 34. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said this. Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. Whoa. Hang on a second. Here we see Jesus redefining what true family actually is. He says, it's those who do God's will. They're my family. They are my family. And who are those who do God's will? Only those who are disciples of Jesus Christ. Sure, we're not perfect at obeying God, but we are on that I like to say it's all about direction, not perfection. We are disciples who who choose to follow and trust in Jesus. And Jesus is saying, those people, they are my family. And Jesus here is redefining for us what family is. There's something special that I have with you guys who are disciples of Jesus and disciples all around the world. A special, unique bond that I don't have with any other person in this world. Now, you might be tight with your blood family as a Christian, but you have this unique, deep, spiritual bond with fellow disciples. Have a look in John chapter 1, how deeply bonded we are in Christ. In verse 12 of John 1, it says, Yet to all who receive him, talking about Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to what? Become children of God. To those who have believed in Jesus as their Lord, they've been adopted. They have been adopted into the family of God. You remember two terms ago we looked at Romans 8. God does that by sending his Holy Spirit. It works at the same time as putting your faith in Jesus Christ. And he calls you to himself and adopting you into his family. So if you haven't turned and trusted in Jesus, you're missing out. You're missing out on this deep spiritual bond that we have with each other as fellow disciples. So come and join us. Put your faith in Christ. Make that next step. You ever heard that um, saying, blood, might be thicker than, sorry, blood is thicker than water? Meaning families first over anyone? Well, yes, blood might be thicker than water, but the Spirit of God is thicker than blood. We have this unique and special bond like no other. Well, if, if Jesus bonds us as disciples through his death, his resurrection, what he's done and giving us his Spirit and adopting us, that means we are his family, aren't we? So how can we be putting our church family first? Then that was the, the main point. How can we put, be putting our church family first here at MBM Youth? Well, I thought of four ways we can do that. There are many ways we can do this, but I picked four. The first one is this. We can consistently, we can consistently and constantly be committed to meeting together as a family. There are many ways we can do this. We can uh, be doing that on a Friday night as we gather. We can be doing that on a Sunday at church in the mornings or at night time. We can do that at G-Teams, which we talked about before. We can gather as a smaller group. We can do it in one-to-one relationships or other groups outside of church that gather as God's family. But we can be committed to gathering. That's the first thing. Um, I spoke with a young man two weeks ago and he said, Brandon, I wish there was more church stuff throughout the week I wonder if you have that same desire to meet with the family of God you want more one night's not enough one meeting's not enough you want to continue gathering with the family of God maybe when you have an assignment due or you've been invited to a birthday party or you're not in a social mood, or you're get, not getting along with someone here at youth group, or you don't like the food that we eat, or you've just bought a new video game you want to play. I wonder if you will put the family of God first before your own desires. And that brings us into number two, which is not committing to activities during gathering times. Mm. It's not committing to that sport that trains on Friday nights and plays on Sunday afternoons. It's not saying yes to a study buddy during Sunday afternoon G-teams. It's not not planning a catch-up with friends constantly at a time that we meet together as God's family. So what commitments maybe do you need to reconsider that are in your life? That you have been pushing aside the family of God? It's important to get this right, guys. Meeting together. Because meeting together as disciples, you know why it's so important? 
Because meeting together as disciples encourages all disciples to keep walking as Jesus' disciples. When we gather together, we are mutual encouragement to one another. Putting God's family first, it doesn't just mean our commitment and time though. There's another way that we can do this. Um, And we can give to each other. We can use what God has given us to give and to bless one another, can't we? The first way we can do that, is, which is number three, is giving our money. Now, I know that many of you don't work or you don't really get much money. You might get 10 bucks a week pocket money. But here at MBM Youth, we're committed to supporting the Borg family, which are going overseas to Malta to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus with Maltese people. Now, that might look for you if you earn 10 bucks a week pocket money, you know, supporting them with one dollar out of your money. $1 a week. We also support them prayerfully as well. But what we want to do here at MBM Youth as we look to disciple you and see each other discipled, even as leaders, is grow generous hearts. Generous hearts. It's not about the money. It's about the heart behind the giving. And any money, this is, whether you're year six, whether you're year 12, any money that you receive in your week, the first thing that you should think of is how can I give this toward God's kingdom to seeing the gospel go out? How can I give this to to love my church family, to bless them. The next one is, we can use what God's given us in our gifts for his kingdom and for his family. Look at Romans 12. It says in Romans 12, Paul's writing this letter to the Roman church. He says this in verse 4. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we though many form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. We all have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. You see there, keep that up there. You see that we are all different. But as even in our difference, we make up one body, one family as Christ as the head, Jesus as the head. We're all gifted differently to use for the, for the body, for, the God's, for God's family. Some of us gifted in music, we've just seen that. Some up front speaking, some one-to-one speaking. Some are gifted on computers Or some are gifted at just having an awesome personality and a good character that brings a really good culture to people around them. We're all gifted very differently. But the question is, are you using how God has gifted you to bless his church family, your church family, to to advance his kingdom? That's the question. There are many ways that we can put our church family first by serving them in our gifts. So I want you guys to ask your leaders how you can do that. They might even help you identify maybe how you're gifted and how you can use it for the family of God. Um, Jesus really emphasizes for us the importance of putting our church family first above all other humans. But it, it poses a really important question for us to ask, doesn't it? What about our blood family? Our relatives, those who were born the family we're born into, the household we live in. Even further, what if they're not disciples of Jesus? What if they're not Christians? Do we just neglect them? Do we just worry about gathering with the family of God? By no means. No, 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 no. God's word also teaches us in 1 Timothy, anyone who does not provide for their relatives, especially their household, is worse than an unbeliever or is a curse. Also in Ephesians 6, to us kids, it says to what? Obey your parents, honour your father and your mother. What a privilege that we get to be a part of a family whom we're brought into. Either we are brothers or sisters, or sons and daughters, some mothers and fathers. And we get the privilege to be lights for Jesus even in those homes. Isn't that great? Isn't that great? It's not, it's not either or. You don't have to pick one. It's both. It's about priority. And I want to say, the more, the more that you gather with your family and, and strive to grow in your love for Jesus together, the, the better that you will love your immediate family and your blood family, those who are at home. Now, I know some of you might not come from amazing families. I want to say a couple of things on this. Firstly, don't give up. Always pray for them. Always. Second thing I want to say is some of you come from, and if you are in a relationship in home, at home, where you are being abused in some way, whether physically, emotionally, sexually, or verbally, 
You need to speak to someone straight away. Don't put up with that. Come and speak to me or come and speak to any, any of the pastors here at MBM. But I also want to say this. It doesn't matter what family you come from, whether they're good, bad, great or terrible. If we're in Christ, if you're in Christ, we, as disciples of Jesus, we have a family that will always love us. You have a family that will always love you, no matter what, and that will last forever. Isn't that amazing? How good is that? How good is that? We have this deep spiritual bond with fellow disciples. So put your church fam first because you'll be able to love your household and blood family even better. Why are we to do this? Because as disciples of Jesus, we are to place Jesus above everyone, aren't we? That's our call to discipleship. But you can't love Jesus without loving his people. And that's number two. If the church, if we believe the church is God's family, we would love our church family like Jesus does. In, in Matthew 25, which is another gospel in the New Testament, Jesus says that when he returns, he's going to divide every person every person that's ever lived up into two groups. He's going to put those who are his sheep on the right and the goats on the left, those who haven't trusted in his name. And to the sheep, he's going to look at them and say this, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. For I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison, you came to visit me. Then the sheep will answer, Lord, when did we ever feed you? When did we ever give you something to drink? When did we ever invite you in or clothe you or look after you or come to see you? Lord, we've never done anything. Think about that. Disciples, have we ever, have we ever met Jesus' need in any way? Clothed him, fed him, supported him. He does not need us. So why is Jesus saying that his sheep have done this to him? But look in verse 40. In Matthew 25, Jesus says these words, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. Wow. Jesus says here, whatever you do for my people, you do for me. It's a little bit like my sister, Alyssa, and her family, uh, her, sorry, her daughters, daughter and son, her children. My sister and her children, they have this really unbreakable bond. Whenever I see my sister, there's a photo coming up of her little cute family. My sister's there in the back and her two children. Whenever I see my sister, she's always with her kids, Indy and Zane. Whenever I'm with the kids, I always am with my sister. They have this unbreakable bond, this unbreakable relationship that is like no other. And it's very similar, even more, even more with, with Jesus and his people. You can't love Jesus if you don't love his people. There is an unbreakable bond between Jesus and his people. When we love our church fam, we love our number one man, Jesus. So I want to ask you, are you loving your church family here at MBM Youth? And this is really where we need to be honest with ourselves and ask God to reveal maybe in our hearts where we're not loving our church family all that well. But also, it's, it's also to be excited in, in the future, in how we will love them. So let me ask a couple of questions. Even in your differences, we looked at being different as God's family. Are you loving your church fam? In your bad mood, are you loving your church fam? In your boredom or apathy, are you loving your church fam? When you've got a thousand and million other things going on outside of MBM Youth, are you still loving your church family? You know why this is so important as disciples? Because love is what makes us stand out as disciples of Jesus. That's what Jesus says in John 13. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. How? If you love one another. If you love one another. The hashtag for disciples of Jesus is hashtag love. That's how we're known. That's how we're marked out. And it's, a, and it's a really powerful way to share Christ with other people. How can we be loving each other here at MBM Youth then? Well, I've come up with five ways. One is serving each other. 
So just before Jesus gives this command to love one another, do you know what he's doing? He's washing his disciples' feet. Imagine this, 12 Middle Eastern men sitting around a table, dirty feet, been walking around in the dust in Middle East, Jerusalem, all day. Jesus gets on his knees and washes his disciples' feet. The king of the universe gets down and does only what a servant would do. And then he says to his disciples, do likewise to each other. So we are to go out of our way to serve one another in the way that Jesus does. That could be picking up a brother or sister for youth group or G-teams. That could be going out of your way to meet each other's needs. Could be physically. Maybe, they're, maybe someone's sick and they need a message or a card or some flowers or some chocolate or even just to be around them. Maybe not if they're sick. Emotionally, if they're sad or upset, you might want to just listen to them. Hear them out. Spend time with them. Spiritually, if they're struggling with their walk with Jesus, you can't meet that need, but you can pray for them that God would do so in their life. Look for ways to lay down your life for your church fam. Number two, we can speak to each other in love. Every word that comes out of our mouth, we must think, is this going to be uplifting for the person, encouraging and loving? Now, sometimes loving is actually not saying anything. Sometimes it's actually dealing with something you don't want to. You might have to say to a brother or sister, mate, or sis, I don't think that's the way that God wants you to live. You should probably, you know, think about that, pray about it. Let's talk through it. Let's get back on track. Sometimes it's having the hard conversation. Loving people with words is also not gossiping behind each other's backs. You've got to think when you talk about someone, is this going to be helpful for them? Would I say it if they're right in front of me? If not, if you answer no to those questions, then don't say it at all. Number three, forgiving one another. We need to be quick to forgive. We're all sinners, aren't we? We've all stuffed up. We've all made mistakes. And if God has forgiven every single sin, if we come to him, if he's forgiven our sins, how can't we forgive each other? You know, some of the most powerful words I've ever heard someone say to me are these words. When I've hurt them pretty bad, Brendan, I forgive you. In those words, I hear the voice echoed of my Lord Jesus, that when he went and walked to that filthy cross outside of Jerusalem, when the Roman soldiers were beating him and mocking him, and when the fellow Jews who were his people were doing the same thing in, in mocking him and spitting on him, Jesus says these words and only these, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. So do we need to forgive someone, part of our church fam? Or maybe you need to say sorry. Be quick to say sorry. Be even quicker to forgive. Wouldn't that speak volumes of our love for Jesus? Number four, caring for each other. We can have general caring for one another and just doing nice things, but also caring for those who aren't as privileged as maybe you who are sitting in that chair. Some of us come from great families. Some of us come from families that are financially stable. Some of us come from um, good friendships and good health, but some of us don't. We need to be looking at how we can care for those people. Because you know what? God looks at his people and, and doesn't think there's someone better. He looks at everyone as equal value. Because we all are a family in his family, God's family. So why don't you go and speak to someone you wouldn't normally tonight? Number five, point each other to Jesus. This could be potentially the most loving thing that you could ever do to someone is point them to Christ. I wonder if your friend that you bought tonight doesn't know Jesus. Maybe you should go and share the gospel with them after this. Tell them that Jesus died for them on the cross to forgive them, to bring them to God. Why don't you share that wonderful news with them? Or maybe someone, you've made, your friend is struggling. Why don't you grab them and say, how are you going with your walk with Jesus? Share your struggles. Share something you're thankful for. Pray with them. Maybe you want, might want to continue doing that for years to come. There's some ways that we can love our church family. You know, we have really big goals here at MBM Youth. Big plans to see 200 disciples, one for Jesus, over the next eight years. To see this auditorium filled with the youth of Western Sydney, delighting in the love of God and growing in their love for Jesus. Sending you out to schools to share the gospel. You know what I'm really excited for, though? Is seeing how we will be loving one another. Loving God and putting each other first. 
That's what I'm excited for. A healthy youth group, a thriving youth group, an amazing youth group or church isn't about how many we have on a Friday night. It's not about how amazing the music is. It's not about how great the game is. It's about how big our hearts are. It's about how much we love God and growing in our love for God. It's how much we love each other. It's how much we put each other first as a family because that's what disciples of Jesus are called for and known for. And as disciples of Jesus, we are to love Jesus and love his people. And that's where we want to be in five years' time if we really believed that the church is God's family. Let me finish with this quote that I read during the week. While it costs us a lot to adopt children, it costs God the blood of his own son. MBM youth, let that truth, let that truth that God gave his one and only son, Jesus, to bring you into his family. He, he gave him to go and die on a dirty cross to adopt you into his family. Let that truth drive you to love one another and put each other first to love each other like Jesus, the greatest lover of all time. Amen? Let me pray. Pray with me. Father, firstly, we're thankful for the love that you've shown for us, for giving your son up to die for us, Lord. Thank you for adopting us into your family that we are able to be a part of a family that will not only be great now, but will last for all of eternity. Father, I pray for those who are outside the family of God right now, that, Lord, you already know them and already have planned for them to be a part of your family. And I pray, Lord, you would bring them now, that your spirit would be active in their heart. Father, that they would come to put their faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray over these, these young men and young women and myself and the leaders, that we would strive to put our church fam first and that we would strive and work hard at loving one another so that we could be the family of God that you've called us to be. In Jesus' precious name. And the church said, Amen. Shall we keep...